everybody. Welcome to the uh, March panel with Andrew and Nate. I am Julian Lytle, the host or moderator. Uh, you might ask why am I the moderator. I do a podcast called Ignorant Bliss, and it deals with like uh, issues of comics, creators, and race, and issues of like that. So it's not eloquently said, but that's why I'm here. Uh, um, my name is Andrew Iden. Uh, this is all my fault. Um, and I'm the co-author of March. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Nate. Uh, I drew March. And I also do other comics. Anyway, thanks for being here, y'all. That's it. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Peace. All right, guys. I guess, um... I guess I want to start with, with uh, what's a little background story on the creation of March, even though this isn't the first panel for some of us. This is the first time we've might, uh, had a panel with you guys about, about this trilogy of books. So uh, we want the origin story. Yes. Um, because even the creation of this was like a comic book. Um, so I guess it all started in 2008. I was serving as the congressman's press secretary on his reelection campaign. And, you know, it was the summer of hope and change. Barack Obama was sweeping through the Democratic primaries, and people were asking different things of their government. And, and people in government were asking different things about what they could do. And so it was kind of coming down to the end of the campaign, and folks were talking about what they were going to do afterwards. And um, some folks were going to go to the beach. Some folks are going to go see their parents. I said I was going to a comic book convention. And they laughed yeah. at me. Yeah. They laughed at me, except uh, there was a deep voice that said, don't laugh. There was a comic book during the movement. It was very influential. It was John Lewis standing up for me as he s stood up for so many of us. And I went home, and I, I, I looked up this comic book. It was called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story. Sold for 10 cents, 16 pages, cover to cover. It was beautiful, you know, this is mid-50s studio house style, very well done. Um, and so I, I sort of became captivated by it. I mean, here I'd been a lifelong comics fan. I, I started reading comics when I was eight. Um, I wasn't there. <laughs> I'll trust you when you say <laughs> you're eight. Now at this point it's like, what have I always said? But Uncanny uh, X-Men number 317, 317. That was about 93. Phalanx so Covenant. Right. Yo, that with, was a hot issue. Yeah, right? <laughs> with the lenticular issue. cover. Yo, have all of them still got that. Yeah. Uh, Pre-fatal pre -fatal attractions or post-fatal attractions? No, it's after fatal attractions. That's after attractions. fatal attractions, yeah. Yo, Jubilee was heavy in that. Right, right, because <laughs> I remember trying to, Wolverine 75, the fatal attraction was like really hard to find. Because I've he rips that. out his adamantium. Yeah, yeah. That was a good issue. Um, um, <laughs> and so, um, so I just started asking the congressman, back to the point of, um, why don't you write a comic book? And at first he was really nice. He said, oh, well, maybe. But I kept asking, and, and you know, maybe is a nice way of saying no in politics. And, and so I kept asking and asking and asking. Finally he said, okay, I'll do it, but only if you write it with me. And it was that moment that changed my life. And then five years later, we released the book, <laughs> finally. <laughs> um, but I guess at that point, you know, we went, we, um, you know, how many of you guys are trying to work on your own book and try and hit it with a major publisher? So this one's for you. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, I got turned down a lot for March. Yeah, see, they're like, yeah. Come um, on. Yeah, don't tell them. Um, and it, it wasn't until I got referred to Top Shelf, to Chris Staros, by Jimmy Palmiotti, of all people. Um, after I called the front desk at Marvel Comics and said, hey, this is Andrew Iden. Uh, I work for Congressman John Lewis. Um, I'd like to talk to Jimmy Palmiotti. And there was silence on the other end of the phone because they were probably terrified that we were about to investigate them again. <laughs> um, but he called me back, bless his heart, and, and really helped me out. And um, I'll never forget pitching Staros over the table at MOCA in 2010. It's like every fantasy I'd ever had, all wrapped up into one. There was Alex Robinson, and I, I don't know if you guys have read it, but I love Box Office Poison. Like, it's just a profound graphic novel to me, especially at that age, you know? Um, and he was sitting there, and he was like, hey, man, that sounds like a good idea. It's like, oh, man, Alex Robinson likes my idea. 
can I get another copy of Box Office Poison? <laughs> Stars was like, you can have $5 off. It's like, cool. So he went for it. I pitched him. He was like, you know. Actually, if I'm totally honest, he said, well, I've never seen you write anything. So why don't you go spend a couple months, write as much of the script as you can, and send it to me, and then we'll see. That's all I needed, really, was that sort of moment. And I went home that night, and I was staying with a friend who had been my friend since high school. And I, I remember getting back to his house and telling him what had just happened. And I was like, we got to celebrate. And my friend looks at me and he goes, no, you got to write. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat down and um, almost unchanged, on spec, I wrote out the first six pages of book one that night. Um, maybe even 10 pages. And um, went home the next day, kept working, kept working, kept working. And uh, finally, I sent what I thought was an 80-page first quarter of the book to Staros. And I know it kind of sucks when you have to wait for people to review your submissions. Uh, and it was only like a couple weeks, but I'll never forget how painful those couple weeks were. Where, where every moment it was like, oh, he hates me. I, I'm terrible. I'm an awful writer. I'll never make it. My life is over. Um, until I got that call. And uh, I was actually outside with the dog picking up her poop. And, and I literally poop bag in one hand, phone in the other. Um, and he said, hey, man, I just want you to know I read the script and I, and I like it. Uh, I think I want, uh, I want to publish this. I dropped the poop bag. I started dancing around. My dog's looking at me like, oh, shit, he's having a stroke. <laughs> Um, but that was it. That was that was the moment. And then you know we got to work. And then from there, oh yeah. So I, I've been working on the top shelf since like 2005 or so. Um, and I I think it was like mid 2011 or something. And I was wrapping up work on some other books. I remember reading this top shelf press release about March, and you know. Obviously, spoilers, there was no artist listed in the press release, but my brain had no reason to piece together that that meant they needed an artist. So then like a week or so later, but I remember being like, oh, that's a cool project idea. Well, back to work. But then, yeah, Staris gave me a call. I was like, Nate, <clears throat> I strongly suggest you try out for this job. I think you can handle it. And, uh, but beyond that, beyond like getting like the, the heads up, it was very much like any collaboration I've done with anybody else. So Andrew and the congressman directly sent me a couple of pages of script. I did demo pages. They gave me a couple of notes. I redrew parts of the pages. And then like two weeks, we're like, OK, let's make this book. There's actually a funny story in that process. So when we sent Nate the script pages, like there's some things in John Lewis's story that are just immutable. Like You cannot change them. And so Nate has a great mind for f simplifying and drilling down to the core of it. Um, but those first sample pages, he cut out something John Lewis said. He, the story of uh, when he meet, first meets Dr. King, and he said, and, I, and he says, you know, and then I said my whole name, Dr. King, my name is John Robert Lewis. He was like, that's redundant. And then cut it from the sample page, sends it in, and the congressman's like, outraged. You cannot, ch what did you do? You didn't do it? Like, that is not my, you know. And we were like, OK. So then Nate and I had this phone call where I was like, so I really want you to bring whatever you can to the page. But bear in mind that there are some stories that the congressman tells that are just the way he tells it. Yeah. I've so, never met him at this point. Right. And you're, yeah. I mean, it was walking with the wind was the extent of your yeah. introduction to John Lewis. And um, <laughs> so he's like, OK, well, let me, let me try again. And then he turns in basically the opening of the book. Right, because mm -hmm. like, you took those what was originally supposed to be, I think, a three or four page dream sequence, made it into six, mm -hmm. and added like the, the panel. I'll never forget if if you remember the opening page. There's like a wide shot of the bodies going over the bridge. That was not in the script. That was all Nate. And when he turned that page in, and we sat there and looked at it, that was the moment where it was like, he's gonna make this story better. Oh. I didn't know that. Yeah. I also didn't know John Lewis was outraged at, at my, <laughs> my, my I can tell his story now. Yeah. <laughs> it's over. All three books are out now. Plus, remember, he's never outraged in front of anybody. Oh, well, I know. It's always just to me. And then I have to explain it. 
And then they don't believe me. They're like, but he's so sweet. <laughs> like, yeah, uh-huh. I don't know. I read, I read those books. He doesn't seem sweet all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would turn up. <laughs> exactly. So, um, being that I just uh, mainlined all three books in like five days, um, it's very, uh, what caused you to use the framing device of the um, inauguration of President Barack Obama for the overall story, I guess, of the early parts of John Lewis's life from childhood on into the march to, to Selma? Um, I thought that was very interesting, being that, that that was such a, that was a major moment for uh, a lot of black people, being that a lot of us never thought to see a black president ever. It was, a, it was a major moment for me too. I mean, my father was a Muslim immigrant, and so somebody being named Barack Hussein Obama and, and being the child of a Muslim immigrant, like it wasn't, it was big for African Americans, but it was also big for kids like me, who were like pretty much told from birth, like, Hey, that Muslim last name you have, I know you're raised Methodist, but you know, politics, maybe don't think about it. <laughs> um, so I staffed the congressman that day. The scenes that you see of that day are actually the scenes I witnessed. And so, you know, Nate came to the Capitol uh, early on, and we went and I walked him through it all. I was like, so that's where I stood. That's where the congressman was. This is the room. Oh, this is the first, this is like within five minutes of meeting Congressman Lewis. They're like, okay, let's take a walking tour. You can't take pictures a lot of this, so you need to remember this for like four years from now when you have to draw it, <laughs> which is exactly what I had to do. I actually had to go like Terminator style, like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> we, we are terrible to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, Look, I shouldn't have been the only one to see that. And, and, and the only way anyone could see that is if you got this, this incredibly hard to get credential saying that you were allowed to be in the Capitol on that day. There was like maybe 150, 200 people who were allowed to be in there unless you, had a, unless you were there because you had a gun or you were security or you were some sort of like military personnel. Um, and I was there because John Lewis had an office in the Capitol and I was the one who was like, okay, like you're not, because you don't. I don't actually. I didn't actually get to see the inauguration because if you look, like flags cover all the windows. So the inauguration to me it was the strangest thing. I was in an office facing a television that was that way, feeling the roar <laughs> behind me, being like, "Oh, I can't see that. Okay, that's cool." Um, and, but when you're inside that day and you're watching John Lewis. He was reliving these moments. From the first moment I saw him in the morning, he was just telling me the stories. He was, he was reflecting. He, was, he has these photographs of the movement up in his office, and he was looking at them and like tearing up when he saw Bobby Kennedy. You know, and, um, and there was people coming and going. His, his sister was there. Um, the kids were sort of boiled down from several kids who came through, so we, we tried to sum it up. Um, and I shouldn't have been the only one to be there. And so I wanted to share that. Um, in some ways, it was inspired by Mouse, because he gets to have these conversations with his father. I never knew my father. My father's dead. He left when I was a child. He never wanted to be a part of my life. And so John Lewis was the closest thing I ever had to a dad. And, and having these conversations, this was, this was my conversations with my father. Um, and the other part of it is that there will come a day when every child in school Every child that's, that's being educated in America will have only lived in a world where Barack Obama had been president. And that marker needed to be put down for the generations that would come afterwards. What it took, what that day meant, and what it was like before Barack Obama was inaugurated. And so in many ways, it, it was to put that marker down so they would think about that when they discussed the significance of his presidency. And in some ways, it was a tremendous risk. I mean, if he had gone full George Bush, we were screwed. But I, I really, I think from the, the outset, we all believed in him, and we believed that we would be sitting here eight years later looking back on a presidency that will be exalted by history. Okay, okay. Um, I got a question for Nate, being that I'm an artist. Excellent. Um, I was looking at uh, your technique and the way you were telling the story, the way in which you would use 
uh, breaking panels, the way you should use the lettering, the way you also use the word balloons layered. So like there's parts when people are yelling, but they're in the background. So you can only tell scribbles or mm -hmm. the, the one scene where you have the phone, the phone cords wrapped around the word balloons. Also, um, some of the things in regards to your use of tone, like what type of materials we're using, like were there markers and washes, uh, inks, and also your choices to uh, represent television, television uh, viewings as pencil drawings versus drawing them with, let's say, like a, a thinner line instead sure. of the brushwork. Well, <clears throat> to put that in the, the most efficient order, all my work is physical, just uh, just India ink and then all the gray tones are, I make three different uh, gradients of gray out of the same India ink. And basically I run a hair dryer over the line art to make sure it's, it's like it's sealed so there's no bleeding. And then I paint over it um, and I only do clean up in Photoshop. Uh, a lot of the components, like especially with the TV and the, the general wash uh, application uh, was worked out in its entirety in a book that I did beforehand called The Silence of Our Friends, which is also a period piece, which is by and large nonfiction, but has a fictionalized kind of narrative framework that kind of condenses a year's worth of events into a few months. But uh, I, I was working on Any Empire and Silence of Our Friends at the same time, and every day, six, or you know, six days a week for a year and a half. And in order to break up the monotony and be able to change gears, I was like, I need to have two different approaches to art so that I won't just get, so these things won't blur together. And I was like, well, this is a period piece and I didn't write it. So for Silence of Our Friends, I'm just gonna experiment with these gray washes. And it turns out that with my like Michael Golden, Arthur Adams, Barry Windsor Smith influenced excessively rendered, hatchy, textured art that I've loved my whole life. What I've really been aiming for is these flatter applications of tone. And I was like, as soon as I got started on Silence for Friends, I'm like, oh, this is what I've been trying to do. I just have never bothered to actually paint over my line. Uh, and for the TV, uh, it was actually kind of, I didn't, I thought it was going to look kind of crappy. Uh, but I was still fairly early in my personal quest to be competent at Photoshop. So I think it's about five or six pages into Silence of Our Friends. Uh, these two kids uh, go inside the house after they're playing and they walk in and it's January 31st of 68. It's the day of the Tet Offensive. And they walk in while their mom is watching uh, the, the live, or not, it's not live, but watching the execution of uh, the prisoner from the aftermath of the Tet Offensive, which is the, its most famous as a, as a photo still, uh, where he's, he has a revolver up to his head and he's blindfolded. But it's actually a video sequence. Uh, and it's very long, relatively speaking, uh, and very painful to watch because it is so long. Um, and so I just decided to do that in pencil uh, just to see what it would look like. And I was like, I'll just go back in and, you know, paint over it or whatever. But just by scanning it in and then upping the contrast, it appeared to glow all of a sudden, which I wasn't expecting. I was like, oh, it actually looks like a TV in this dark room. Uh, and so a lot, of the, a lot of the period piece and technological uh, or applications of technology in March, uh, Silence of Our Friends was basically like my boot camp. So when it was time to do March, I was able to just hit the ground running. It just went down to straight to thumbnails. Um, with a lot of the lettering, uh, I feel like uh, my work on Swallow Me Whole kind of broke a lot of that mold in terms of what I want to do with it. I've always sought to make uh, other sensory experiences besides visual experiences uh, readable in comics through a purely visual medium. And so uh, with Swallow Me Whole, a lot of it has to do with sensory issues and has to do with patterns. Uh, but there are these moments where, you know, when a character was trying to read information or, you know, was trying to hear what someone was saying in a crowded cafeteria, I fell back on these Chris Claremont X-Men comics where I remember telepathic characters being like sort of overwhelmed by too many human voices. And as a kid, I thought it was really cool how the, 
there'd be all this overlap and this jumbling of word balloons. But even before I realized I was going to do something with it later, I thought it was weird that all the lettering was perfectly readable, house style. And so we have this visual shorthand that we accept, you know, where when things get further away, they're less detailed, the lines are simpler, they're harder to make out. Uh, so to me, it was just as simple as like, if we want to make this gaggle of human speech, you know, um, its own kind of indecipherable pattern, then literally make it indecipherable. So I started uh, writing the lettering with my inking tool and eventually turning it into scribbles. Um, and the, the same, it works the same way, especially because we're quoting people whenever possible in March. There's an, we have a responsibility to be accurate. And there are moments where uh, people who were there you know, remember specific things being said. And there are other moments where one of us, whether it's you or whether it's just me, like filling in word balloons from a mob uh, or from stand, you know, bystanders, uh, you, you either have to omit speech balloons, which kind of breaks the illusion, or you have to fill it in with something. So you know, it's weird because as March has been, in, as it's been embraced as history as well as memoir, you have to play by certain rules that keep history books in classrooms and in libraries and used as history. So there's also this weird gray area where it, it's a responsible thing to make some of these things that we're basically like paraphrasing and making up halfway illegible uh, because we're trying to make everything that was really said legible. And so, you know, when it comes down to that, you're like, well, somebody's about to get a bunch of scribbles here. And also like, uh, as, as like a white artist on this book, like, you know, like I get pretty burned out on the hate speech real fast and I have an obligation to put it in the book, but then I have to make up a bunch of people who are just as messed up as the people I'm quoting. And so that's like, you know what, I'm kind of done with that. So you're going to get some more angry scribbles, but at least now I don't have to write, you know, like the N word. Yeah. You get 47 you get more intent. times. Like yeah. when you see, when you draw the faces of the people yeah. and they're angry, angry faces. I, yeah. You can totally get it. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, how does that feel, I guess, now that the book, that all three books are done? You know, how does it feel finishing and completing? And how does it feel, I guess, with the response to these books, like being history books or memoirs? Because when I finished it, I was like, I might have to talk to some of my education people. This might be something, it seems like a real good way of bringing about teaching these lessons about what happened. I don't know if there's anybody else or any more institutions like state school boards and stuff it's like maybe you want to put this in the school libraries and such for that exact it, this has been like half of our work on march has basically been like us scrambling to meet these challenges as they hit us and like i knew march was gonna be bigger than anything i had ever done relatively because i'd never really done anything that was above any kind of radar but none of us had any idea what the potential like scope of the project could be until the first book was in people's hands. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, okay. This is a whole second job we need to do while we're making the trilogy happen. Uh, if you guys know Brett Warnock, who used to be with Top Shelf, um, he and I had set a friendly wager before book one came out. It was actually at SPX um, the year before. And I was like, you know, we seem to be, like, this is coming together really well. You know, I think we might be able to get on TV for this. How about I bet you that March book one could debut at number one of the New York Times? Never gonna happen, man. Don't even do that to yourself. Just, just enjoy it. I got this package from Brett about three weeks after book one came out with a hard cover of blankets and a hard cover of Lost Girls being like, you were right, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, I guess I'm the dreamer of, like, in a weird First way. First off, you got one of those blankets hard covers. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, man. I passed it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was that guy who was the one who was like, with the reality distortion field, I think, mm -hmm. in some of this. Um, like when the third book came out, we, you know, we'd hit number 12 once on Amazon and I was like, you know what my goal is for this book? I think we can break into the top 10 on Amazon. Never gonna happen, man. 
<laughs> we hit number two. <laughs> if Harry Potter hadn't been there. <laughs> um, but, but schools, Andrew, schools. <laughs> yeah, all school. this is good. I'm good with all this. Um, it was weird to be at this moment, right, where you're looking back on it, because I lived in a hole for eight years trying to get this done. Um, the schools have been the part that surprised me the most, because you sort of think, like, well, what books are you taught in school? To Kill a Mockingbird, published in what, 1960? 54, 55. Yeah. Um, these, most of the books you read are old. I, I don't know of another book where they're like, this one's going into schools, right? And then it just happens. I'd never seen it before. So you sort of hope that like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, they teach mouse in school now. So maybe there's a road for us. And the dominoes really started to fall last spring where we'd heard all the teachers who were like, yeah, I, I put it on as an extra reading in my class, you know, and that's where it would start. And then the kids responded. And then we got these notes where it was like, so I just want you guys to know your book's creating a little bit of problem in our class because the, teach, the students won't pay attention to me. They just keep reading it. So I had to take their books away until it was reading time. I've never had to take books away from a student because they <laughs> wouldn't stop reading it. And you're like, oh, this is, this is catching on. And then we get the phone call from New York City. Um, it was actually, we went to speak at Columbia and about a year ago. Um, and we gave a speech there, and the head of social studies for New York City Public Schools was there. And I was just talking about, like, the nine-word problem. Have you, are you guys familiar with the nine-word problem? Um, essentially, it's a term coined by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they have a publication called Teaching Tolerance. Nate actually animated one of their videos. Um, and and they, it's called the nine-word problem because most high school students graduate knowing only nine words about the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and I Have a Dream. That's it. For me, being on the Hill, I, it just boggles my mind because you can't understand the politics of today without understanding the civil rights movement. And if I'm totally honest, like there's a bunch of members of Congress who don't really understand the civil rights movement either. So it's not their fault, it's just that they, they, never, they were never taught this and then they never made the effort to learn it. Um, I, I saw once a member of Congress say, well, when the voting rights struggle started in 1965, and I just went, oh, <laughs> come on, man, you're a chairman. Um, yeah, um, but that cognitive recognition, right, that's what I kept talking about. I was like, you know what, we have to teach them this history. And even if it's not March, fine, find a tool, but we have to make this happen. Because you cannot tell me that's not deliberate and systematic, right? If you don't teach nonviolence in schools, then you can't teach, you can't empower students. Right? And looking at it from the other side, being in Congress, I realized most of them are more afraid of the students than the students are of them. And so there had to be a reason. Why wouldn't you want to teach them? Why would you turn Martin Luther King into a caricature? Reverend Warnock at Ebenezer, he's the current pastor, he says it this way. The Martin Luther King Jr. that we celebrate today is not the Dr. King that was assassinated in 1968. And so for us, it became a, a, a second pillar of our mission, not just to tell the story, but to find a way to go to schools and to talk to them. And so we go to Columbia and we give this talk. And, um, John Lewis gives his talk, and Paul Levitz, right, DC Comics former publisher, he's the one moderating this, and so it's like, you know, this is cool, and Lee Housekeeper, the president of Columbia, he shows up, and I'm like, oh, this has got to be the most distinguished room full for, for a comic book that they've had in a while. Um, and so, afterwards, we're shaking hands, and the head of social studies for New York City Public Schools comes up, and he's like, I swear to you, this will be in our curriculum. We're like, that's really sweet, man. That's awesome. Like, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, that's, a, that's the largest school system in the country. Can one man really make that difference? And then a few more of his folks come up, and they're like, we work for him, man. We're really excited about this. Do you have some study guides we can start looking at? We're like, okay, we'll give them to them. This sounds good. Cool, they move on. Then Chris Claremont came next. I'm distracted. It's Chris Claremont, you know? <laughs> like, oh, man. He's like, I came to your lecture. I'm like, no, you didn't. No. <laughs> Excellent. Right. And this guy who wrote, you know, every story oh, that's that. That's not the case. <laughs> um, and so a couple of weeks go by, and then we get a letter from New York City Public Schools saying, congratulations, you've been added to the Passport to Social Studies program. You will be a core text. And we lose it. We're like, we'll be there with bells on. Whenever you want to make the announcement, we'll be there. 
So we go, we announce, we do a signing and everything. We're like, great, you know, this is a big step. And that was in May. And since May, we've gotten San Francisco confirmed. We've heard from schools in more than 45 states that they're teaching March. And on top of that, I know of several more school systems that are going to announce in the coming weeks. Major citywide school systems. I don't know how this is supposed to go, but without a doubt, it's working. <laughs> And for us, the story I like to tell is that when I was a kid and I was in English class, I had comic books out on my desk. And my English teacher took them away. She said, you can't have those out right now. Those aren't real books. This is English class. And well, uh, I got to go back to my high school with Congressman Lewis and have a, a wonderful conversation with that same teacher about her experiences teaching our graphic novels. And I, I don't say that as any form of comeuppance to the teacher because I, I really believe she was doing the Lord's work. And, and honestly, she was expressing the prevailing wisdom at the time. But I offer it as an example of the brief period in which change is possible and the power of an idea whose time has come. And so for March, this shouldn't have been possible. Every sensible common Every, every politico, let me start with that, right? Everybody on the Hill thought this would fail. But you can't listen to them. I loved comics since I was a kid. They were my refuge. And I wanted to bring them to everyone else. And what I hope more than anything is that it teaches the students about what was sacrificed and given and done during the Civil Rights Movement and opens the door for a new generation of comics literature to come into our schools. Well, congrats on that success. I didn't know, of course, how, how could I know, but I like the fact that it's, it's in and up in all these, these school systems. And there's study guides. Uh, if you go to topshelfcomics.com slash march, there's all these study guides. Because the important part, I think, is that we open the door to the use of primary sources. That was what maybe, to me, it made, I think, our research and creative process different because we, we, we read the books, you know, we read Taylor Branch, we read Hank Klibanoff, we read Diane McWhorter, we, we read all of these major works about the Civil Rights Movement. And we said, okay, that's great. Now let's go look at the SNCC after action reports. Let's go look at the Watts line reports. Let's go look at the meeting minutes, right? There's a scene in book three that Nate affectionately dubbed the Council of Elrond. Um, there's like so many Lord of the Rings references in this whole thing. It's true. Um, Actually, Bob Moses talks about Lord of the Rings in book three. Um, but it was a moment where we needed to explain everything that was about to happen. And I don't think any of us wanted to uh, put down anyone's views. We, we just didn't want to like, let it get consumed by everybody else or that it wasn't that important. And we needed to show that there was broad discussion and broad disagreement in how to proceed. And so it kind of comes down to it. And Nate's like, man, you got a lot of dialogue in here. And I was like, well. I got it from the meeting minutes from that meeting. This is actually what they said. It's not in any book, anywhere. They sum it up in a sentence or something like that. But to me, when you saw that whole conversation take place as they contemplate this major move into Mississippi that would ultimately result in several deaths, bombings, shootings, um, it was absolutely important that you see every voice in that room. So that when the young people today contemplate a major move, they understand what exactly was in those previous rooms and that their complicated, messy room of different voices who don't agree is OK. In fact, it's the way it's supposed to be. And by being able to use these primary sources, often which were digitized within the last few years, it weren't available to other works. Um, I think that gave us the ability to put a realism in there that had been previously impossible. Okay, I have a quick question. So you say you've been working on this for like the last eight years, essentially. So like, yeah. when was the, the the production time of the book? Like, when did you finish book three? I should say. Well, oh, in, initially, when I signed up, March was one volume, yeah. mm -hmm. and the the first final working version of the script was basically for about half the length of what the trilogy is now. But it's a single book. And I went in and I was just breaking it down and pacing it according to my own storytelling style. And I, I was like, you guys, 
or maybe you guys. No, it was in San Diego. Oh, it was in San Diego. Yeah, yeah we, we had a little powwow at 2012 in San Diego where I was like, this is, this is about 550 pages of comics. And before that, we're like, yeah, well, let's just, you know, like we didn't have, you know, we did not have these expectations for where the book was headed. We were going to make a good book. So initially, we were like, just take your time. We're going to make this tome. But San Diego, we're like, you know what? We're like, let's just take some of the pressure off uh, and divide it up into three books based on its natural breaks. And it, it, I'm amazed now when I look back and I'm like, we didn't realize any of the benefits to breaking it up into three books, particularly like the most valuable has nothing to do with, with stuff like sales or marketing. It has to do with the fact that as the book gets more intense and brutal and it gets darker, you know, like you have to age into reading that. But like, you know, my, my four year old every few months requests to read book one as part of her bedtime read. And we read it over the course of about four days and she completely gets it. And I've been able to even adapt my, my reading style and add more and different details and context over the last year as she's grown into it. But you know, like if it were this brick, this like eight pound book, that came out one time, you're not going to get fourth graders reading it in their class. Uh, you know, like you're not going to get four year olds asking, asking all these questions about Emmett Till at bedtime. Um, like to me, that was the most profound, like throwaway decision we made. We're like, oh, let's just like too stressful. Let's just break it up. Not realizing that would revolutionize our work on the project itself. So then, so like years of work up to that point, and then. I drew book one mostly in the course of six months and there, we weren't at a rush to release it. It was nice and breezy. But then like as the mission became much more complex and Lee, our editor and publicist, who's very, very involved in the day-to-day -day operation, um, as he had to jump in the game more and more and more book, through book two and book three, and became at times in a 24-hour around-the-clock situation so that one of us was working on March at all hours of every day. Um, for, for several months? Yeah, several months for books two and three. And, uh, and these were moments actually where usually one of you two would, un like there were times where you'd uncover uh, corrections to the existing historical record or add new information and we would go back and like rework things as needed but there were these these amazing moments where working on march was actually becoming a living process in itself the book was even though we're, we're talking about something which occurred objectively the the work on the book itself was turning into something that was surprising us uh, at times, which was very rewarding. So book two, like as we had these additional responsibilities and we started touring and talking about the book, uh, you know, that book was probably a year and it was a year to a year and a half of solid work, but I, I drew it in about a year. I had to take three months off in the middle to finish up a for hire job on a Rick Riordan book. And so we lost some time and then I had to double my pace. And then book three, it was even more compounded with more more needs, demands, more research. Uh, and so we, we, all, we basically lost like six months then. And so ultimately what had to happen is the, like we, were, we had a second draft that was workable of the script and we were rolling with it. Uh, Andrew and Lee were collectively like re-editing in real time and you were rewriting as I was drawing, but I had zero pencils done in August, late August of last year. And in nine months, I went from having nothing done on that book to having a finished 250 page comic. But it required like my wife, Rachel, like she restructured her, her job. She quit being full time. We lost health insurance. Uh, we changed our like parenting schedules, like in order to make 40 pages of finished art a month for nine months to make it happen. Um, so as the books became bigger and more intense and denser, the time allotted for each book actually shrank. Um, so I, I'm actually, I'm amazed that book three isn't just like a heap of indecipherable garbage. When it was done, we were actually all amazed. Like we had like a month left and one of us was like, you guys, I guess I'll say this. I think this might be the best book. We were, like, we were afraid at that point to be like, I think it's kind of good. 
but yeah, we collectively agree. We're like, it's the best one. How did we do that? So I guess I, the reason I asked that question was because how does it feel writing this book about John Lewis's life with the movement, with the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s? And in the last two years, such a, a sense of return to a new type of civil rights struggle in terms of voter registration laws, police brutality, uh, inequities, things like ta Hasi's Coates' story on, on redlining in the case of reparations, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, Trump, all of that, along with, you have the context of the past, but it's almost just like repeating in front of our very eyes. Right. So just before book one came out, I, Congressman and I guest edited, Nate did the cover and some, some illustrations. Um, an uh, issue of a uh, magazine called Creative Loafing, which is the Atlanta Free Paper. And we, we, we did it on the future of nonviolence. And our thesis was that something was about to happen. That we looked around, we were at a breaking point, that technology and its ubiquitous um, nature in our life was going to change everything. And that this generation in particular was ready to organize. And you can, you can Google the article, like we put it in print. And this was 2013. This is pre, this is right after the Voting Rights Act decision, right? Yeah, it was like a month. Like a month after. So we'd actually written it before the Voting Rights Act decision came down, and then it went into press. Um, and then at the San Diego Comic Con panel, I thought I was going to be funny. And I was like, you guys watch Battlestar Galactica? Well, all of this has happened before, and all of this will happen again. And at the time, I, I really thought I was like being clever and funny. And now that I look back on it, it's the saddest thing and also the most optimistic thing that we could have said. Because in the worst way, all of this is happening again. But in the best way, it is also happening again. Because I remember a decade of my life when I was a student, when everybody was asking the question, well, how do we get young people to care? You know, how do we get them to organize? How do we get them to participate? And we're seeing it. I mean, uh, if we can, I mean, y'all's voting percentage still sucks. But the organization, the, the, the people who are devoting themselves to activism, right? Like Blair Amani, who I love to talk about, she was a student at LSU. She read March because she got a free copy. She came to our lecture and she came to us afterwards and she was in tears and she said, I think I want to devote my career to activism. And she went on to organize the protest in response to the Alton Sterling murder. And she went on to then, after she got out of jail, organize the vigil in response to the shooting of the Baton Rouge police officers. She was trying to bridge that gap that we need more desperately than ever, right? Because it's not that this stuff wasn't happening. It's not as if it's getting worse. But because of camera phones, because of technology, we can see it clearly for the first time. And that was in large part our point from the very beginning, the, that you can't sweep these things under the rug. And as technology changed and the potential to organize has changed, they won't be. And the students won't let them be if we teach them how to organize and how to use the principles of nonviolence as another generation did. And it's not just Martin Luther King Jr. It's Gandhi. It's Emerson and Thoreau. These are unique principles, uniquely successful principles for activism. And I'm glad we're confronting them now. I'm not glad Donald Trump is out there. But he's no George Wallace. And that's what people need to understand. He's a lot like George Wallace. And if you're scared by this, imagine what 1968 was like. Right? It, it, you look at this, the big part of the book three is explaining to you where the seeds of this come from, right? It's the Republican convention in 64, where, where Nelson Rockefeller gets booed off stage for saying that they should put equality in the Republican Party platform. Because there were Republicans who believed in this. But in order to win elections and protect business interests, they pushed them out. Democrats aren't blame free either. Yeah. I, mean, I see it on the hill, you know? 
But what I see as the antidote is a generation that understands how to put pressure on these elected officials. There is a right way and there is a way that they will use it against you and weaken your movement. And all too often, even still today, there are too many openings. But when I hear activists say, you know, the, the older generation, they won't let us on stage. We, we've got to push, we've got to pull, we've got to take this over. And it's not right, it's not the way it was during the movement. I'm saying, no, it is exactly the way it was during the movement. And don't get discouraged. This is what happens. And you have to understand that so that you don't burn out. You have to, Congressman always says this to Nate and I, pace yourself. Pace yourself, because it's not the struggle of a day or a week or a month or a year. It's the struggle of a lifetime, which to go back to your earlier point is why you frame it around the inauguration of Barack Obama. So that you see that, that you, can, you can be an activist at 22 and a high point won't come until you're 72. But if you become bitter now, if you burn out, if you walk away, if you do too, if you, if you, if you can't contribute for the long haul, then we're missing out as a society. It's also why I get so into the idea of student loan reform. Because if there hadn't been, if there had been student loans during the movement, you wouldn't have had the Civil Rights Act or the voting rights. I mean, imagine if Bernard Lafayette or, or C.T. Vivian or James Bevel or John Lewis had, had student loans, when they, they wouldn't have been arrested on the Freedom Rides. Right? They wouldn't have been there. They missed their graduation because they were in jail, right? Yeah. But they had student loan debt. They went, oh, no, I got I to gotta go work for Sears. <laughs> Gummy Wars is hiring. Right? Yeah. And so for today's activists, I feel like that, that, that's actually the purpose of student loans is to keep them in control. So that you say, no, I, I actually really need to, to go get a job, so I won't be an activist. I won't disturb things. I won't get arrested. I mean, look at the whole system, right? You get a drug charge. You can't even get student loans, which means you can't get higher ed. You right? can't get a job. You can't get a job. It's all, it's all set up that way. So I, I, my belief is that if we can get rid of student loans and we can make college more affordable, higher education, we can open that door and make, make campuses a hotbed of activism again. <laughs> and hopefully on those campuses, they'll be reading March. Hopefully. <laughs> I get, uh, since we get into the, I guess, late part of, of the panel, Maybe we have a, a few questions, maybe? I know somebody got questions. So there's a mic right there in the center. You talked a lot about your uh, resources, your written resources. I'd be interested to hear a little bit about the visual resources for some of the uh, settings and the clothing and uh, those kinds of details. Sure thing. It came, it came in different waves, different strata. Um, on an immediate level, uh, as I was working with each chunk of the book, um, Andrew would send me, well, Congressman Lewis has an incredible archive. Like he, he's a collector nerd also. He, he, he is a collector nerd. As an aside, in book three, when he gets his little program envelope signed by President Obama, I had to, and you know, I was researching what the card looked like, and I was like, Andrew, I was like, did everybody get this card? Like, is everybody standing there? Is it a thing where you get it signed? And he's like, no. He's like, just John Lewis bought, like, he was like, ready to get it signed. He's like, you don't understand what a collector nerd John Lewis is. <laughs> so he has this, his office is just like, like every available space is just like a small pile of like photos and signs and books and everything. So you had access to this amazing archive coming in. Um, Lee, once he really jumped in with book two, was doing an incredible second wave of research behind that, bringing in reference. Um, my first, my initial responsibility for a period piece like this is always clothing, technology, hair, uh, buildings. And all of us are Southerners. And I, like, I'm from Arkansas. I also spent my elementary school years in Montgomery. Alabama, and my family's all from Mississippi. So in an environmental uh, context, I'm very, very familiar with the setting of virtually every part of March. And so it, there's a level of audacity here in, or in this kind of assumption, but I felt like it was also my responsibility whenever possible to rely on my own memories of place. And I, 
I'm 38 now, so like the gap of 15 years between a lot of these events transpiring and when my memory starts, like 15 years is nothing. And so the, you know, 1983 Montgomery, Alabama, when I'm looking at photos is from a 2016 perspective, it's virtually unchanged from 1965 Montgomery, Alabama, which has over the years of working on March has been more and more of a shock just watching the eclipsing of time, of the passage of time. Um, so it involves, like, I was a little anxious about, like, Im embedding my own memories of, like, certain parts of, like, the old Troy Highway and certain kinds of grass and trees and buildings. But I basically got, like, a giant thumbs up from Congressman Lewis, and then I realized it was working. It allowed me to, like, just trust that I know the way that plants work and the way that build what buildings are made of in the Deep South. Um, but still, I was doing one to one and a half hours one to one and a half hours of like Google image search every day. And so usually all three of us were every single day emailing each other reference and research for visuals. Um, and uh, you know, every once in a while you'd unearth something that was a complete, that was actually new. But well, the photographers mm -hmm. who would send us stuff after a while. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, so, so after book one came out, like we started to get some attention. And these photographers would come out of the woodwork. I, I worked for SNCC. I worked for uh, what was called the US Information Service at the time. I worked for uh, Life Magazine or um, like Bob even, you know? Um, and they would just all of a sudden be like, here's a book of photographs, mm -hmm. right? And we'd send them to Nate, and then the just stack would grow and grow and grow. Because at a certain point, I think we reached that critical mass where everybody was like, at, at least the folks in the movement who understood how significant it was that we're finally being able to break through and make it commercially successful. You know, because it's like you can win a lot of awards talking about the civil rights movement, but how do you get it onto the bestseller list? How do you get people to read, right? And so they started chipping in. They were like, here's my contribution. Here's some images. Here's some prints. Um, you guys know that photograph of the young lady who's at the March on Washington, the little girl holding a pennant? Super famous, right? I had no idea who the photographer was, but I'd seen the image a hundred times. He popped up. It's a guy named Roland Sherman. And like, just as like a gift, he sends us a signed, like, nice printing of it or whatever. And I, I don't have nice things like this. Um, <laughs> but, but they wanted to help. They were trying to support us because they, they realized how much further we could take their message. Um, and sometimes it was helpful and sometimes it wasn't. I mean, sometimes these guys had their own ideas, but the support, I think, was, was morally important at certain points, too, for us. I think the last point here, and then I think we have to actually wrap up, unless yeah. we have a, okay. Uh, I'm, so, I'm the, sorry, we, I got the, the warning. We can answer questions at the, at the booth in a second, though. That's, that's where we're going. Just back to the booth. Oh, okay. he just said that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, uh, as the scope and scale of the movement expanded radically from book one through book three, basically it, it has to do with there are more people shooting film and taking photos of what's happening, and thus there is a certain subset of events where you have a much tighter accountability of who was there, what they look like, and how they're dressed. And so, at a certain point, I realized that was going to get tighter and tighter. It it basically reveals where I'm free to make up people and make up their clothing tastes and make up cars and stuff. But yeah, when it comes down to like Bloody Sunday, you know, like on the, on the cover of March Book 3 and in that entire 12-page sequence, the first 25 people in the marching line, that's exactly what they're wearing in the order that they're wearing it. And I knew that like, all, it's like all my years of training in March have come down to this one scene where I need to nail these 25 people because more than anything else, like this is the kind of documentation that like blew the situation wide open. And it sounds silly to explain it, but like you better know who's got what scarf and what hat. And you know, like Bob Mance with his, like, yeah. it's part of the, like the radical humanization of all, all people on all sides of the equation in this story. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate on hearing, you know, where you're getting to your different sources and things like that. But I imagine Congressman Lewis was also his story. Right, right, yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you ta talk a little bit about sort of that process of how he shared his stories and how on both sides the art 
as well as, as, as the text and how yeah. it came together? Um, well, so it started with, I'm going to do this very quickly. It yeah. started with several hours of interviews, maybe like 20. I have all the tapes um, very, very early on. And this was actually before we even had a publisher. I just started interviewing him. And it was like late nights, weekends. If I ever release them, they have to be heavily edited because what will happen, I'll be like, Congressman? No, no, no. Congressman, are you there? <laughs> Congressman, wake up! Right? A lot of that. Because it was, it was like midnight, and we're working on this thing, and he's been you know, at work all day, and we're both exhausted, right? And so you ask him all these stories, and he's telling them. It's like sitting at Grandpa's knee, you know? You're, you're like, sir, tell me the Selma story again, you know? And, and he was amazing, because he is a tremendous storyteller, right? So just put yourselves in my shoes, where you're like, oh my gosh, I get the, the civil rights movement from John Lewis yeah. right there. OK, go ahead, sir. You know, it was just incredible, because he, and he has this memory that is unparalleled, right? I mean, they can He'll drop like new details like last week. Yeah. Like when this is all done, we were doing a talk somewhere, doing something. Like no, yeah, and he, no. like, March Book Three is done. It's published, <laughs> and then he was telling some account of like, yeah, and after the the disillusionment from Mississippi Freedom Summer and the DNC in '64, like, you know, we went, we took this big trip to Africa for a few weeks, and then all of a sudden he's like, yeah, and we got off the plane, and. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, she came down the steps and she got on her knees and she kissed the ground and she said, I'm home. And then I was like, first I was like, <laughs> tiny tear. Then, uh, then mentally to Andrew, I was <laughs> like, why isn't this in book three? <laughs> he's like, like, he's just so full of detail at certain times. He's like, oh yeah, by the way, here's another pearl. I'll just like throw it at you. I'm like, what? Yeah, well, and that's sort of the challenge, right? Because you had to get that story when you could get that story. Um, and, and for him, I mean, this is a guy who never cut back on his day-to-day -to, -day to make room for March. He just worked that much harder. Yeah. And so it, it was on us to try and, like, find every piece of that that we could. Uh, and so at a certain point, that's why we had to become uh, researchers, too, because, uh, I mean, in book one, we, we almost missed one of our first big book events because the government was shut down and they kept threatening votes. And they would call them and they would call them. And I remember them being like, Congressman, they say they have votes right during your amendment. Congressman's like, I've been in this Congress for 30 years. They are not calling this vote tonight. And you're like, oh, he's good. You know? And they didn't. He was totally right. Um, but, but then there's the other part of it, when he would read the pages, and you'd give them to him, and he'd be like, yeah, I read them all last night. You're like, no, you didn't. And then the next day, he would say, that one thing, that tree, we need to do the tree again. And he'd be like, wait, you really did. So, okay. I'm good. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you for going for the panel. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>